we're going to start now. Five more words. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul makes it clear to din it in. Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. God's Word until people get it, not just with the ear or the mind, but in their spirit. And today we're going to take five words from the larger number of words that we go to several times. A couple of weeks ago we had words we use. I think there's 50, 51 words. And we took five, but here's five more. So I didn't print the whole thing, but just the five words that we're going to look at. And of course, beyond the words, we're looking at the meaning. So let's put those words on the screen, if we have them, Ryan. And uh, when we've got them there, then we'll go into it. Here they are. We're going to look at Agios. We would say hagios. They say agios. It's a Greek word. This next one, apollomi. It, it, it doesn't mean the thing, but it rhymes with follow me. Apollomi. Apollomi. It rhymes with follow me. Apollomi. That's a Greek word. Here's a Hebrew one, which is powerful. Melak. Melak. M-E-L-E-K. And then one that we have been on several times, paraclete, and that's Greek. The parakletos, the one called alongside to help us. These are the five we're going to look at. And then number five, dunamis, from which we get the word dynamic or even dynamite. So here they are again. And as you see, there's four Greek ones, and there's just one Hebrew. As you know, the Greek is the New Testament, the Hebrew is the Old Testament. Agios, Apollomi, follow me, Apollomi, Melech, Paraclete or Parakletos, and Dunamis. Thank you, Ryan. All right, I'm going to look at the notes in a moment, but let me just say this. It all started with a flyer. I was very young, and the flyer came through our door in Belfast. And my mother said, I'd like to go and hear that man. It was advertising that a special speaker would be speaking in our area, not in a church, but in a community center, and there were different churches sponsoring it. He was special because he was a personal friend and knew Stalin of Russia. He was from Russia and knew Stalin. In fact, went to school with Stalin. He was a Jewish person and then had got saved and went around Europe uh, talking about the Lord Jesus and the things of God. And uh, my mother said, oh, I'd like to hear that man, Dr. Beskin, Dr. Beskin. I was very young. Uh, I mean, not a child, maybe, I don't know, 12, 13, or 14, or something like that. And I remember, I said, I'd go too. And I remember going and hearing Dr. Beskin. And it was a wonderful thing, a friend of Stalin who had got saved. At the end of the service, they called one of the sponsoring pastors, the local pastors, called one of them to close in prayer. And he got up and he closed in prayer. And when we were going home, we were walking home. It wasn't too far. But when we were walking home, I remember distinctly my mother saying how she enjoyed the meeting. I remember I, as a young person, I thought it was great to hear this friend of Stalin. But, but my mother said there was something else. She said it was the way that local pastor prayed. She said he prayed like a house on fire. And she said, it reminded me of the way they used to pray in the Baptist church when I was a little girl. And so she made inquiries as to uh, where this man pastored. And she, we found out if we lived here, the Presbyterian church that we went to was here, and he was up a hill here, so we didn't know it was there. Anyway, 
And he pastored a little holiness church, as they called it. And so my mother was so touched with the man's prayer, as well as the whole meeting, she started to go to this little holiness church. And that's where my problem started, big time. It was a disaster. However, my mother was certainly led of God because when we went to that church, that's where I met Maureen. And I always say, I swam through shark-infested waters to get you. (laughs) Because I landed in the middle of totally false doctrine. And I want to talk a little bit about it, not in an unkind way. We're not putting people down. Many of the people were nice and godly people, in a sense. And their hearts were after God, like mine was as a young person. I'm now developing, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. And I was seeking God so much. They taught briefly this. And you have to be warned about it. They taught you should get saved. That's a definite act of salvation. And then, as soon as possible thereafter, you've got to get sanctified. As that's what they called it. Got to get sanctified. And when you get sanctified, you're made totally holy. And uh, therefore... Because I wanted to serve God, they told me, in fact, to tell you the truth, they spoke more about sanctification than they did about salvation. They said sanctification was a definite second work of grace. I'm repeating their words. And that everybody should have it. You get saved, then you get sanctified, and then you're totally holy, you're totally His. Well, I don't know. I think I came out to get sanctified 19 times, and it never took. I was a young person. I always remember Maureen. She never came out once, and she's better off than I was. I remember, I've told you before one time in Ireland, we were in a town called Bangor, and uh, we had an American guest. And, and the American man said, well, let's stop here and have an ice cream. But if you're sanctified, you can't have ice cream on a Sunday. And when he handed me the, as we called a poke, handed me the, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, f- I thought of putting it in my pocket, not to touch that. And because I was so convicted, I, I wasn't holy anymore if I'd taken this ice cream on a Sunday. My... Concern was made so much worse when I looked over at Maureen. She was enjoying it. (laughs) Oh, that I had her freedom. Actually, what happens is when you get saved, you can't be any more saved than you're saved. Sanctification is a gradual work of the Spirit just like we talk about over here, the brazen altar, then the liver. And we will never be totally holy on our own except by the holiness that's given as a gift. D.K. Usine, it's the gift of righteousness. And one of the saddest things in the world is to see people trying and doing things, whether it's at the prayer meeting, you know. You just have to pray for an hour, nothing less. I remember I got so convicted about doing, doing, doing things that if I'd made arrangements with you, this is true, if I'd have made arrangements with you to see you and to meet you at three o'clock at the post office and I showed up one minute late, I thought I was going to hell. Why? Because I broke my word. I was a liar and all liars go to hell. This is the bondage that it brings about, this so-called it's, it's like putting on, it's a put on kind of religion. I'll always remember Sister Greta and Sister Belle, two lovely ladies. 
uh, who worked in a factory uh, quite a way away from the church. They had no car, and they walked to every service. And I remember Sister Greta leaning over the rails at the front over the altar. I can still see her weeping and crying. She did it repeatedly. She could never get peace because she never understood imparted holiness, imparted righteousness. She thought you had to attain it. I don't know if you've ever read the private letters of Mother Teresa. I I read them and stagger you. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't want you to know about this, but they were published then, they were withdrawn. Saddest thing you ever read. She keeps referring to Jesus as the absent one. The absent one. She was always doing something, trying to look after little children or feed them. That in itself is good, except you're doing it to attain holiness before the Lord. You don't do that to get holiness. You get God's holiness because he died on Calvary for no other reason. Works can be awfully bad thing if it's because of the wrong motive trying to attain something from God. And she said over all the years in all her doings, she said, I couldn't find the absent one. Mother Teresa, up to her eyes in religious works. I'll never forget many years ago, the first time, many, many years ago, I held meetings in Mexico City and uh, in different parts of Mexico. Uh, but this was in Mexico City at, at the big Catholic the, the big Catholic churches there, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I went to see what was going on. There's such a line outside, Disney-style line, you know, like this. People on their knees, gradually getting closer and closer, where you could get inside the foyer there. And I looked in there, and they had a little, like a little doll this size of, the, of Mary, so-called Mary a little bit of glass in front of it. And if you got there close enough, as long as you've gone on your knees now, you, you must impress God. You have to go on your knees. Hundreds of people, maybe thousands, like this outside. And when people would get in there, all they had to do was touch the glass. You couldn't actually touch Mary, you touched the glass. But if you were strong enough to lift yourself up and kiss the glass, there was much more blessing for you. Oh, the horrors of religion. The biggest curse in the world is religion. Look what religion has done for the Muslims and their their so-called dress and praying five times a day. Look what it's done for Roman Catholicism, making people go through all kinds of things to reach him. No wonder Paul says, it's in Colossians, he talks about will worship. Will worship worshiping from the flesh, trying to do things to please God. The only relief I got back there, listening for a number of years to this trash, that's all it was, was one day in desperation, my mind was going crazy. And I remember saying, God, I can't please you, Lord, no matter what I do. I can't please you. And I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit as a young person And here's what he said, son, you will please me when you realize I am already pleased. Pleased with what Jesus did on Calvary and what you've got to do. This was the interpretation, as you know. You just got to rest and trust. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. If it's of works, then this fellow can boast more than this fellow because he does more works. Works are good if they follow on but when they're used to attain. It, 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 it's, it, it's a tragedy. Oh. You know, the devil, listen to me, he either wants you to get into gross sin down the dirty path, robbing banks, stealing horses, committing adultery. Whew. Or if he can't get that, he wants you to go this route, but it still goes to hell. And the route is super religiosity to prove to God 
that you really are holy and you're worthy of him. Let me tell you, friends, Paul said, in me there dwelleth no good thing. We're all a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners until Jesus saves us. And the only way we can get right with God is not by any works we do, but by trusting in what he did on Mount Calvary 2,000 years ago. Will you say amen to that, friend? You know, the, 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 the religious religiosity, it does things to people. Do you know, it takes away your naturalness. You know who the most natural person was who ever lived? It was Jesus. He was natural. That's why he's supernatural. What is it to be supernatural? It's to be supernaturally natural. When you've got a cloak on or under an umbrella of religiosity and trying to perform, 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 perform. I said all that as a lead up to the word agios. Agios is translated in our Bible either as holy or saint. We're a saint. The Roman Catholic Church says that the way you become a saint, you have to be dead so long, and then somebody has to produce the fact that you were responsible for at least two miracles when you were alive. And after much investigation, if they can find two miracles that you performed when you were alive, and enough time has gone by, then they will declare you a saint. Agios. But I want you to know this. Well, let's go to the notes. That's what we'll do. Go to the notes, would you please? The first one, Hagios or Agios. Do you know that the word Agios literally means different? Look at me, friends, one more moment. We're going to go back and forward. God says, be ye holy as I am holy. Now, that, that, that can't be. We can't be like him because he's perfect in his holiness, in his non-doing evil things. He's perfect. We're not. What he means is, be different like I'm different. What do you mean God's different? Well, he's so different that the theologians call him other. Can't get a word to describe him. He said, I want you to be different. That's what agios means. Holy, it's translated, but it means different. We're different from this world because of what he's done. So it says in your notes, this word literally means different or committed. It is usually translated as saints or holy. Now, this is what I want you to get this morning. However, it has to do with commitment rather than performance. For us to be holy, it's, it's, it has to do with commitment. What does that mean? We'll look at the next bit. God does not require us to be totally perfect, but to be totally his. That's commitment. And when we're that, then we're agios. We're saints before God, for we're dependent on his holiness and his holiness alone. And all we can do is to respond with our commitment. Lord, I'm not perfect, but I'm perfectly yours. Lord, I'm not totally perfect in any way, but I'm totally yours, 100%. If you're that, then you're holy before the Lord. With his imparted holiness and your response. Am I making any sense? Give me a wave if you will. Religion is a curse. And it makes people unnatural with their piety, special clothes, the Pharisees standing at the street corners with their long prayers and their long robes. Jesus dismissed it all and said it was ridiculous. We've got to be normal and natural and filled with God. And I used to say many years ago, talking again about Maureen, that she was the happiest person I ever met. She's the most natural person also that I ever met. And I thank God for her ever so much. Give her a cheer, will you? <laughs> for instance, it says in Romans 1 verse 7, to all that be in Rome, you're beloved of God, you're called to be saints. What is that? 
somebody, are you ready for agios? Somebody that's set apart. It's like uh, this pulpit here. As far as I know, he hasn't been sinning during this last week or doing anything wrong. But he's got one thing to do, sit there and hold my Bible. He's committed to that. When you're committed to God, you're a saint. You may not be perfect, but you're a saint before God because he's got the imperfect part covered with his imparted righteousness. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts off by assuring the people that God just loves us so very, very much. Acts 9, 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints. You know, some people think a saint like the three wise monkeys, say no evil, talk no evil, think no evil. No, we're normal, we're natural, but we're redeemed. Therefore, we're agios. Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. This is not to show that these people were wonderful with their works. Psalm 16, verse 3, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Exodus 3, 5, and he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thy standest is holy ground. What does agios mean? Here's what it means. It's rendered, we're consecrated to him. We're dedicated. We're a saint. It's also translated sometimes as a sanctuary. But it has to do with commitment. So what am I saying to you? Stop trying to be holy. Stop trying. Stop it. Be normal, be natural. Accept his gift of holiness and be dedicated to that relationship with him and instantly you're one of the saints of God. Hallelujah. And thank you. Then it says here, thank you so much, it's commitment. Agios does not mean anything to do with performance. You're not a saint because you went out there and performed holy works, put on some special clothes and fasted in such a way, nothing wrong with fasting, but, but uh, 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 oh boy, he's so saintly. He's, no. Saintliness is from God, and your response is that you're set apart to God. Instantly, you're a saint. Apollo me. Go to the next one. John 3, verse 16. It means to perish, to ruin, to destroy, or to lose. We are no longer losers. St. Augustine one time said, God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us to love. What does apollomy mean? It's in John 3.16. It's the Greek word for perish. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish. What does it mean? It means, you see there, perish. For instance, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. It means to lose. Will not lose his soul in hell. But it goes beyond that. Apollo means you're in a relationship with God. No matter what happened in the days past in your life, you are no longer a loser, to put it in normal, up-to-date terms, so that if you are a Christian, no matter what battles you're going through, you're not a loser. The person that has accepted Christ and is living for him, that's the last thing they are, because they did the smartest thing in the world to get saved. You're not a loser. Here are some other places where the word Apollo me is found. Mark 9, 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, fairly I say unto you, he shall not Apollo me. He not be a loser. Luke 15, 4, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose Apollo me, one of them, 
does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. Which title would you rather have? Famous, wealthy, redeemed. 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 Because when you're redeemed, not only will you not lose your soul, but you will not lose in life. Because no matter what you go through, he will be with you and will carry you all the way to the end. Say amen to that. I want us to look now at Melech. Wow. Look this way, first of all. We were not in America too long. And a great force came against us. We were an innocent little family. But there was a number of people decided that they would sue us. There's nothing criminal. Certain situation they would sue us. And we received word from some friends who knew the lawyer that they had hired. And they personally told me, he said, Leslie, he's the meanest lawyer in, in Tampa Bay. He's fierce. He's got a reputation of not losing any cases. And we were to face this. We were not millionaires. We weren't too long here. Uh, we, we, we didn't know really how to handle the thing. So we prayed about it. And I remember to this minute where it happened. I was in the shower. I was showering and a certain thing came to me. And when I got out of the shower, talked to Maureen about it, and what came to me was this. Turn it over to a higher court. Turn this over to a higher court. Turn it over to God. Because I had learned, please listen to it. He is Melech, the king. Not only back there or out there in eternity. He's the king for my life and my family. And what does that mean? He will have the last word. I don't care who's coming against you. If it's a judge or a doctor or a jury or a lawyer, turn it over to a higher power. Turn it over to a higher court. And when you do and you've got God on your side, you're going to win. And by the way, we won that case 100%. 100%. We won it. 100%. How did it happen? In the Hebrew, there is a word for king. It means melech. What does melech mean? The one who has the last word. Who has the last word in your life? It's him. If you're trusting him, he has the last word. Oh, such and such says such and such. It doesn't matter what they say. I've told you before about the time that they told me in Belfast, we, we only started a few years, and they said, Mr. Logan's on the phone. I said, oh, he's our lawyer back there. In fact, I had worked for that lawyer, so I knew him well. I said, hello, hey, Mr. Logan. Leslie said, it's all over. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, you have to quit the ministry. And again, it's nothing to do with criminality, but there's certain situations I developed. He said, you have to shut down, get rid of your building. The ministry has come to an end. He said, I have all the details. Well, that's about 50 years ago, and here I am still praising the Lord and glorifying God and preaching his word. Me like, I need to impress this upon you this morning. That Melech is with you. He's the king. He is the boss. He has the last word. Commit everything into his hands. And he will have the last word. And the last word is a word of victory. Look at some of the verses. It says, Melech, which is Hebrew, the king, the one who has the last word. By the way, that's number 35 in words we use. It appears more than 2,500 times in the Old Testament. Exodus 1.15, for example, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives. Go to 2 Samuel 2.4, 2 
And the men of Judah came, and they anointed David king, Melech, the one who has the final say. Isaiah 41, 2, who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. Melech. <laughs> Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. You remember that Lord of hosts? What is that word there? Pandocrator. That's exactly what it is when you come to the Greek in the New Testament. It's pan what's Pandocrator? The God who is in complete control, regardless of all contradictory circumstances. Imagine having a God like this on your side. It's quite incredible. So many times as a believer, Let's say you don't have much money, you have to work hard, you're under the yoke, you're under the burden. You're inclined to feel it's almost hopeless. It's not hopeless. Melech is with you. Trust him. Trust him in this particular area that come what may, his will will be done in your life, not the will of the devil, not the will of any third party. God's will will be done. For the Bible says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Me like the one who has the last word in your life. Let's praise the Lord together. Well, we? Me like, me like. Then we have paraclete or parakletos, the helper. It says, for example, parachute, paralegal. This is one that comes up in the tabernacle tour quite a bit, the paraclete. Look at me, friends. When Jesus said, when I go, I'll send another, our Bible says another comforter, the Greek does not say that even close. So we might as well admit it's a wrong translation there. What does the Greek say? Jesus said, when I go, I will send another helper. When I'm conducting a tour there, I give this little illustration. Just imagine you're walking down the sidewalk, and here comes an old couple. They're coming toward you. They look very old, and they're holding on to each other, and there's something touching about it. But here they come toward you, and suddenly she falls, and you hear, oh, you say, her leg's broken. They're so old. And you're so moved, and, and, and you grab your cell phone, and you call 911 for an ambulance as you run toward them. You get where they are. They weren't very far away anyway. And what do you do? You comfort them. You put your arm around her so that her head rests in your arm. You're weeping yourself. You kiss her forehead. You wipe away her tears. All you can do is comfort her. I want you to know that the Holy Ghost does more than say, there, there, isn't it sad what happened to you? Isn't it bad? Isn't it sad? He's a helper. Soon you hear the sirens. The ambulance men have arrived. These fellows know what they're doing. They whisk her off to hospital. In there, they not only comfort her, they help her. You didn't know how to set the leg or give her what medication, but they do. The Holy Ghost comes into your life to help you, but to help you in the daily affairs of life, not just the spiritual. When you're talking about your car, you're talking about your grandchildren, you're talking about the next meal, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is there. The exact word is parakletos, one called alongside to help carry the heavy end of the log, or we would say the load. Para. Para is a helper. How our translators got that one wrong, I'll never know. But anyway, para the helper. Here's the illustration again I use in the tabernacle. If you were going to jump out of an airplane 13,000 feet, do you think it would be a good idea to have a para shoot on or not? I guess it would be smart to have a para shoot on. Para, same four letters, it means to help. 
well, what would a parachute do that would help you to land safely? When I worked in Ireland at my first job, I was a paralegal. Help the lawyer. Even in writing, if writing just ran on and on and on, it'd be hard to understand. It's broken down into paragraphs, a paragraph to help you understand it better. We have the king of the universe. God himself, through the Holy Spirit, in your life to walk with you and talk with you and to be, now listen, to be with you every minute of every day, just as if Jesus in his physical form were with you every moment of every day. If Jesus was riding with you in the car or living in your home and you know he's a multimillionaire and he's the best healer and the best savior, you wouldn't be afraid of anything. He is in the form of his other self, the Holy Spirit, the parakletos. He lives inside you, and it means to be a helper, one called alongside to help. We almost have to take a moment and say, wow, 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 wow. What kind of a God is this? Though the eternity of the eternities cannot contain him, Yet he comes into me in totality without reducing himself to be an operator, to operate things for me, to help me, to give me wisdom. You're never on your own, not for two minutes. Look what it says there. Helper or the one called alongside to help. Friends, I don't know what I'm going to do. I feel like weeping. It's, it's incredible. Honestly, you talk about El Elyon or El Shaddai, God Almighty is in me to help me, and not only to help, to help carry the heavy end of the log. Amen. If that's not wonderful, I don't know what is. Amen. Give me a big wave and shout hallelujah. It's incredible. It's just incredible. Parakletos. Wow. That's his name, Paraclete. That's where we get Paraclete from. Call alongside to help. Wow, wow, wow. For instance, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, it's really the Helper, which is the Holy Ghost. We wouldn't use that word. We would say the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said unto you. Wow, look at me. He's not only a teacher, but he's an advocate. That was one of my jobs in Belfast. Here's the lawyer's office. Here's Belfast City Hall in the center, and here's the law courts. How many times I walked that all the way down from the lawyer giving the brief to the barrister to fight the case because the barrister was the advocate. Imagine... If you're accused by the enemy and, and, and you don't know what to say and up stands your barrister, your advocate, the Holy Spirit. And, and in, in Belfast language, he would say to the devil, shut your mouth, devil. This is my child and I'll never leave them nor forsake them. Staggering, staggering. Look what it says in John 15, 26. But when the Comforter, the Helper, is come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He will give you God's thoughts, God's opinion, God's way of looking at things. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Helper will not come to you. But if... I depart, I will send them unto you. Lord, Lord, it's, it's fantastic to have you as Abba, my father, my daddy with whom I have a special relationship. It's fantastic to have you, Jesus, as my savior. But Lord, I know you couldn't stay here forever in the flesh that had to come to an end. But still, you, God, and you send the Holy Spirit to help me and to teach me. Oh, we have the mind of Christ. 
My sheep know my voice. He talks. If I depart, I will send them unto you. The last one we're going to look at is dunamis, which is number 42 in words we use. Let me tell you this. Look at me. I give you illustrations about Belfast because that's where I was raised. And uh, I will remember, again, as little boy going down York Street, way more past that would be the city center, the city hall. But before you get to that, you're at the start of Royal Avenue, and this side is Donegal Street South, or, or lower, and this one is Donegal Street Upper. And uh, I remember all around there, there was vacant lots. They'd been bombed out during the war. Remember, I was born just before the war started, so I'm now seven or eight, and I'm down there, and these grounds are so empty. In fact, just here in Lower at Donegal Street is St. Anne's Cathedral, where my mother and father were married. So I remember this well. Anyway, I'm down there with my daddy in this vacant lot, and one day this lorry, we call the lorry, you would call it a truck, uh, this truck shows up, on the vacant lot, and he backs up onto the sidewalk, pavement, we say. And uh, uh, he gets out, he whips off his shirt. Boy, muscles in places where I don't even have places. Strong man. And he takes an iron bar, pulls it round his neck, now it's that shape. He takes, you remember the old telephone directories? And in front of everybody, he rips it apart. You talk about an exhibition of strength. But I still remember just a matter of yards away. I mean, not even the length of the tabernacle away. Right at the junction of the start of Royal Avenue and Donegal Street, there was a man standing in the middle. He was a police officer. He had a cap on, he had his revolver, and he was directing the traffic. I still see it. And you know what he would do? That, that was all. And trucks and buses and trams and cars and horses and carts would all obey that. And they would come this way, or he would do that and they'd all stop. And I learned right there and then the difference between strength, brute force, bending the iron, the iron bar, and authority. Authority. He was a police officer. Peak cap. I can still see him. Not, not his face, but his figure, standing in the middle of the road. The Bible says that God gives us power, exousia, and dunamis against all the power of the enemy. One is authority, and the other one is brute force against the enemy. Let's look at it. Dunamis, which is number 42 in words we use. It means authority. Behold, I give unto you power, exousia, to tread on serpents and scorpions, demon power. And over all the power, that's the force of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notice in Luke 10, 19, the word power is used twice. The first time the Greek word is exousia, which means authority. Look at me for a moment. Can you see the police officer? The first time the word is exousia, which means authority. The second time the word is, the word power is dunamis and means force. Literally, we have both authority and brute force over our defeated enemy, the devil. 
What kind of God is it? I say one more time that when he goes, sends us the paracletos, he then puts within us this power and authority over the enemy, the devil. The devil's very strong. If he's dealing with us directly, we don't have a chance. But he's not. God's in us. And what do we have? We have authority of the name of Jesus to say, I rebuke you, devil. And many times in my own ministry, I've said, demons come out. And they come out. Not because of my name. Of course not. Because of that authority. But also, the anointing of the Holy Spirit gives us power over it. Power over the enemy. So that the enemy is afraid of us. I'm going to read that again from Luke 10, 19. Will you follow it with me? Behold, I give unto you power, exousia, to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power. There's the second time. Same in English, but different in Greek. For one means authority, the other one means force. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Wow. Nothing shall be. What does that mean? Well, God allows us to go through battles and tests, but nothing from the enemy will hurt us. Except God's testing us. That's, then we're, we're free and clear because he'll bring us through that too. But not, not from the enemy. Notice in Luke 10, 19, the word power is used twice. The first time the word is exousia, which means authority. Wow. Can you see that police officer? The second time the word power is dunamis and means dynamite, dynamic, and means force. Literally, we have both authority and brute force over our defeated enemy, the devil. No, I've got to repeat that. Literally, we have both authority and brute force over our defeated enemy, the devil. Literally, we have both authority and force over our defeated enemy, the devil. Literally, we have authority and brute force over our defeated enemy, the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to read it again. Literally, 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 actually, in practice in our lives, we have both authority <laughs> and force. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. And here it's brute force. Means it's brutal against the enemy. Over our defeated enemy. Somebody used to say, if the devil's running after you, defeat him. And that's about it. Take the feet away from under him. Because he's already a defeated foe. Literally, you this morning, not because you're particularly clever or wealthy or magnificent or anything else. You're a wonderful person in him. But in ourselves, we're nothing. But you have God Almighty on your side. The Holy Spirit, the Paracletos, is in you. Dunamis is in you. Exousia is in you. To deal with all the power of the enemy, both in authority and and in brute force. Literally, we have both authority and brute force over our defeated enemy, the devil. Therefore, we must clearly understand these two powerful truths. We have power and authority, and the devil is defeated. And you know how many times I'm going to say that? I'm going to say it ten times. The devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. The devil, our enemy, is defeated. Was it Mount Calvary? The devil is defeated. 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 And we can, we don't look for the victory. We've got the victory. But we impose what we've got upon the enemy with our authority in Jesus' name and also with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Wow, 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 wow. It's incredible. You go ahead and do that again and praise the Lord. We're just about through, but I want you to look back at the beginning and see your notes. Agios. Remember, it's not religion. It means somebody 
who's set apart. Apollomy, remember that one. We're not losers. Melech is the king. That is the one in my life, in my life, who has the last word. I remember, I'm almost through. Uh, we have had such wonderful friends in America. And uh, I hardly like to mention those that are not friends. But, but there are some. And I remember one man one day called me up and he said these words. I don't think I ever told you this before. It's several years ago. He said, I am going to do everything to have you deported. You will not live or operate here in America. I never did a thing to the man in my life except try to bless him. But the devil got hold of him and said, I'm going to get you deported. <laughs> I laughed. I'm depending on Melak. I took it to a higher court. The Supreme Court. To the one who has the last word. You do the same. Melak. Melak. The next one was Parakletos. Not the comforter. God is the God of all comfort too. But Jesus said, it's the helper, para, parachute, paralegal, paragraph, the helper daily. These are not just little things I'm telling you about, like a fairy story. This, this is reality. Dunamis. And I'm going to read that again, and then we're totally through. Look. 10 verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power, exousia, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notice in Luke 10, 19, the word power is used twice. The first time the word is exousia, which means authority. The second time the word is power, is dunamis, and means force. Literally, we have been, literally we have both authority and force over our defeated enemy, the devil. Therefore, we must clearly understand these two powerful truths. We have power and authority. The devil is defeated. And that illustration, when I was a boy in Belfast, I already gave it to you. I remember it well. Here is this fellow bending iron bars over his neck. And here's this other fellow just yards away. One was power. One was authority, and as far as the devil's concerned, you've got both power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Let's rejoice. Let's stand to our feet and praise the Lord. Will we please? Put your hands together. Praise him. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Open your mouth and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.